All right, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's special interactive session, Ask Me Anything with Manish Pabrai. And we're thrilled to have two very special guests with us here today, Monish and Cam. So my name is Pramita Saha, and I'm the Director of Student and Alumni Engagement at the recently relaunched Investment Management Center at UNC Keenan Flagler. So the IM Center is focused on three main pillars, investment management, ESG, and DEI. So the mission of the center is to integrate and holistically manage all areas of investment management at UNC Keenan Flagler so we can prepare the leaders of the industry of the future. And we define investment management here very broadly. So three different buckets, fundamental analysis, so that could be public and private markets um, within equities and credit. And then we also include private wealth, capital allocation, as well as emerging areas such as macro and quant. And on the ESG side, we're really striving to give our students the tools and the vocabulary to integrate ESG into their investment and or business analysis. And then on the DEI front, we're really looking to attract top talent, including diversifying our student base to be 50% diverse in IM. And we're also looking to cultivate a culture of inclusion and belonging in investment management and finance, um, not only at UNC Keenan Flagler, but in the community at large. And then I also wanted to give kudos here to Stokely Griffin. He is a first year MBA student and he really made this special event happen. So thank you very much, Stokely. And also shout out to Stokely and his teammates for their tremendous performance at the Alpha Challenge last week. So UNC Keenan Flagler placed first in both the equity and credit brackets. Uh, this hasn't happened uh, since 2015. Uh, so we're still in shock, but way to bring it back home. So with that, let's turn it back to today's session. And we wanna make this highly interactive. So just encourage you to pose questions at any time you can raise the hand feature on Zoom, you can post questions in the chat. And so we'll go along that way. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Cameron Haidt. He is the CEO of Alpha Theory and Center Book Partners. So Cam is a UNC Keenan Flagler alum. He's been on the Applied Investment Management Board. And most recently, his firm Alpha Theory was a founding corporate sponsor of the new Investment Management Center. And Cam and his team have just been instrumental with incorporating their amazing product into our AIM class. And it's just been a terrific partnership all around. So with that, let me hand it over to Cam. Oh, thank you very much, Ramita. Uh, I am blushing. And thank you, Stokely, for making this happen. Uh, and kudos to the Alpha Challenge teams. That is awesome. Go Hills. Um, so, uh, Manish, I first learned about you uh, from reading the Checklist Manifesto, which I think a lot of people probably learned about you from the Checklist Manifesto. Uh, you, from what I understand, is a, are an ardent uh, Buffett and, and Munger disciple. Uh, you have an amazing track record. Uh, you're a big fan of checklists. Uh, <laughs> and you started a charity called the Dakshana Foundation uh, with the goal of giving back your wealth to society. Um, and admirable. Thank you very much for that. And you are also a glutton for tough questions. So you uh, allow people to ask you questions a couple of times a month like this. Um, your ask to them is to make the questions as difficult as possible and avoid repeating questions that you've had previously. <laughs> um, so with that, I'll start it off. Um, you know, you're busy. You have a lot of high ROI uses of your time. Why do you agree to do Ask Me Anything sessions? I think the best way to learn is to teach. So I have a- Feynman uh, method? I have an ulterior motive. Basically, I, I actually find many times that I feel wiser after some of these sessions because of some of the comments or questions or uh, you know some of the pushbacks and such. That's obviously one direct ulterior motive, but also- uh, the second is that this community, you know, because of the legacy of Buffett and Munger and especially Ben Graham, has a legacy of teaching and educating. And so generally, I think the, I would say the original practitioners and the best players in the field, that's kind of the ethos they kind of laid down. 
So we're just kind of following that path. So it's just part of the credo of being a value investor, I think. That's great. That, thank you. Um, and, and for those that would like to ask a question, as Ramita said, just uh, raise your hand with the, the reactions or put it in the chat, and I will be glad to um, call your name. Uh, so you're famous for checklists. Um, if you were an allocator, investing in a manager, not necessarily investing in a company, because I know that you don't necessarily talk about all the items on your checklist. Um, if you're investing in, a, in, a, in another investment manager, what would be on that checklist? Yeah, I think actually finding a good investment manager is a lot harder than finding a good investment. It is. So it's a, it is a challenge. And I think there's a few things you can look for to try to put the odds in your favor. So one is, I think you would, I'd be looking for aligned fee structure where there's kind of a win-win on both sides. You know, I took my fee structure from Warren Buffett where we don't have any management fees. It's only performance fees. And it's after the first 6% every year goes to investors. So there's a sharing after the 6%. The first thing I'd look for is a fee structure that, it's, that is aligned, which itself would be a stumbling block in this industry. The second is I'd like to find a manager with a lot of skin in the game. So I would look for a large portion of their assets being co-invested alongside me that not only do they gain from the fees, but they also have upside or downside based on their own assets. So that's the second thing I'd look for. The third thing I'd look for is a relatively young person. So basically, I think we need enough, enough years to be able to look back at a track record, but also enough years so that someone could have a 20-year run thereabouts. So probably I would say a mid-40s type age band would actually be ideal because if they've been in the industry for from their early 20s, then you've got about 20 odd years of information to look back on. So the third would be the, the age and then obviously the a track record of what they've actually done that would give you some data points. And one more thing I would look for is where do they go where do they go fishing? If we look at the US public equities markets, they're very picked over. You have a lot of funds. We have more mutual funds than, than stocks in the U.S. by some margin. <laughs> uh, probably more ETFs than stocks. And there's many stocks where they have 30 analysts following them. So the, what I would look for is what's the kind of game plan to not be fishing where everyone else is. So these, were, these are some of the things. And then obviously we're looking for people with high integrity and people that you align with and who in their past track record demonstrated that they can do meaningfully better than the market without taking as much risk. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I, I love to see your process as you go because you, uh, I, I think your checklist is historically notorious for just things being added as you go. I think you said that your checklist was here, then it's got to here. Now it's, now it's like here. I saw you like thinking as you go, you, you said three things and you ended up with seven. So <laughs> that's the way that goes. Uh, uh, Pramita, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to ask a little bit about ESG. Um, in my intro, I mentioned how ESG is one of the key pillars for our center here. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on a few things. One, I think ESG means different things to different people. So how do you define ESG? And do you incorporate it in your investment process? Yeah, I'm not sure you're going to like my answer, but I think that it's a complicated area and we get to some, we get to kind of some strange results. So for example, I think in some list I saw they included Exxon and they ex excluded Tesla. So I'm kind of scratching my head about that one. Basically, I think that it's, we definitely want to look for businesses that are that are good for the ecosystem. But there are also businesses which, if you look at a company like Exxon, it's an essential, very essential business for us to have the kind of quality of life and such that we desire. We just can't banish every fossil fuel producing company and say that life will still be great. Now, we have a choice whether we invest in those or not, and that's fine. So I do look at how companies conduct themselves and how they the choices they make 
but I don't overdose on it. So for example, we've had a, I think this is our oldest investment. It's, we've had this investment for about eight and a half years. It's a company actually got plants all over the world that provides inputs to the aluminum industry. And the stuff they produce that is used by the aluminum industry to produce aluminum has a lot of discharge of gases and such. And it's just part of the process. The company has actually gone well beyond what is required by law in terms of reductions in emissions and so on. And they put in scrubbers and so on that cost them several million dollars a year that their competitors don't do. And they carry that cost. So if you just took a glance at that company or that industry and you were overdosed on ESG, you would just take a pass. But I think when you peel the onion, if you will, then things look, look a little bit different. I don't take the approach that I have to not invest in certain industries at all because of ESG. I just look at it kind of one more layer deeper in terms of what type of corporate citizens are we talking about? Yeah. Actually, that's great. I love your answer. You said I wouldn't like it, but that's, yeah, exactly what we're trying to do here. Basically dig a deeper, uh, dig a little bit deeper to incorporate it into the analysis. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Great. I see, uh, love, you have your hand raised. Yep. Uh, hey, Cameron, nice to meet you. And thanks, Pramita, for organizing it. Uh, Monish, uh, big fan of yours and have read the Dando Investor. So uh, my question was more so, I guess, you know, I wanted to ask on the psychological side, when you do have, like, let's say you start an investment in a certain position and things don't necessarily go to plan, um, what are sort of criteria that you're thinking of internally as you evaluate whether or not to stick with it or whether to double down. Um, and maybe the second question would be is, where, where are you going fishing these days, I guess? Thanks. Yeah, so actually one of the rules and I would say laws of the universe is everything I buy goes down in price. And so I'm just resigned to the reality that it'll be going up till I buy it and then it proceeds to start going down especially after I've taken a full position. So yeah, I'm, I think it's very common in my portfolio that we'll have positions that uh, recent positions that we've taken and we have some loss on them and uh, sometimes even a meaningful loss on them. I think that's just kind of par for the course. And the reality with the investment business is that John Templeton said that the best investment analyst is going to be wrong one out of three times. They're only going to be right two out of three times. More, more than likely, it's more going to be wrong about half the time. Yep. And the good news of this business is that even with a 50% error rate, you can do extremely well, well above market returns and such. So we, we don't want to be using the stock price to instruct us. We should be using the stock price to serve us. And what should be instructing us is the fundamentals of the business. And to, to the extent that uh, something declines in price and we still have caused some dry powder to make it a full position, it would not be the price that would drive that decision. It would be more about what are the fundamentals that has something fundamental changed and uh, that sort of thing. We want to pay attention to all the data. If something's gone through a price decline, we want to understand why that is the case and whether there is some long-term secular issue that uh, we need to pay attention to. But if it is, you know, something temporary or whatever, then for the most part, I'll ignore it. And in terms of places to go fishing, place that I found most productive last few years to go fishing in is in Turkey and 85% annual inflation and everyone and their brother having, ex having exited the market uh, in terms of foreign investors and uh, local investors really having a very short holding period. So the Turkish market is interesting because 80% of the entire market cap of Turkey is either held by insiders or foreign institutional investors. And uh, that portion hardly trades. The 20% that is held by Turkish retail and Turkish institu institution turns over every nine days. And uh, so that's hyperactive. 
And in most cases, retail investors in Turkey, they want to invest at 10 o'clock in the morning and make about 10% and exit at 2 p.m. And so Buffett says the stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth from the active to the inactive. In Turkey, what I find is that a lot of the market participants aren't really looking at the fundamentals of the business. And anytime you're, you've got a four hour or eight hour window that you're trying to hold something, you're not really going to be concerned about what earnings are even next quarter out the window. In Turkey, there are a few businesses which are immune to the inflation. Either they have, for example, revenues in euros or dollars, or they are in, in businesses where they can pass on costs, like a Coke bottle or something. So there's a very small sliver of businesses. I think inflation generally is bad news for equity investors, but there's a small sliver of businesses in Turkey which benefit from inflation or at least are neutral on it. And uh, since everything got thrown out with the bathwater, those things got thrown out too. And so that's the place to go fishing for me. Uh, great question. Uh, what businesses benefit from inflation? So for example, there's a, there's a company in Turkey, I don't own this company, but they export canned and bottled fruit juices all over Europe. And Turkey has access to the European common market. So there's no tariffs or duties in or out. So this company has all their costs in lira, Turkish lira, gotcha. and all the revenues in revenues euros. And, non and so, in fact, what happens generally in a high inflation environment is that wages don't keep up. Mm. So one of the unfortunate effects is that the Turkish people, and we see the same thing here in the U.S. actually, because we're not seeing wages keep up with inflation. We're at 8 or 9% inflation, and uh, last I looked, like wages were going up like 4 or 5%. And so in Turkey, we have a similar situation where the wages aren't keeping up. In euro or dollar terms, every 10% uh, decline in the lira increases these, this company's profits by 3 or 4%. We own a Turkish airport operator. They actually operate airports in eight different countries, 15 different airports. Even the airports in Turkey, their revenues are all in euros. So basically, even there, you know, the their staff and some of the expenses are in lira mm -hmm. and they have no impact from these types of things. We also own a warehouse rental company in Turkey and steel prices have an international price and concrete has an international price and city center real estate in a major city like Istanbul has an international price. And so it's auto inflation index in the sense that those prices of those warehouses keep moving up probably in lockstep, lockstep or ahead of inflation. And their rents go up with inflation as well because it's written into the leases. So there are a few places to play. Probably I would say 95% of the market is not yeah. investable. Yeah. We just need a couple of ideas a year and we're good. That's right. Um, you mentioned earlier the fact that there are more ETFs and mutual funds and there are stocks in the US. And uh, um, that's a sign of the move towards passive over the years. There was a good question from Jim Jones, who is uh, uh, the actual founder of the Alpha Challenge, which we were talking about earlier. And he asked, uh, how much more inefficient does the market get for each point of market share that goes to passive versus active? That is above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I think John Bogle was asked this question about the move towards passive and at what point does it cause distortions? And his answer was that we are still pretty far away from those points. But I think it's getting, I think when we start looking at some of the larger names, the amount that is held by the different large fund houses and uh, in ETFs or index fund and so on is pretty pretty sizable. And, and then you have, you know, you can add to the audit indexers and such, and, and that adds to it as well. Yeah, but it's just not an area that I pay a lot of attention to. So I don't have too much insight I can give you on that. It seems like it'd be an advantage for, for folks like you, where you mentioned the difference between how active traders are in Turkey, and there's an advantage that you get to take because you're long-term and inactive. Same kind of thing, right? That passive creates price inefficiencies that you can yes. then arbitrage. Yeah, I think it, it does create that, though I would say that my general sense of the United States at this point is that it, it's a 
it's quite an efficient market. And it's Did quite you say inefficient over. or efficient. No, it's quite an efficient market. Yeah. And it, it's a very picked over market. So even though we have large amounts of passive investments and such, I don't see I don't see mispricing in the direction of undervaluation. Yeah. I do see mispricing in the direction of overvaluation sometimes. But so far, at least, I haven't seen anything that is helpful to the active investor in the U.S. with what's been going on. That's good. Not that much help so far. That's great. Uh, Quincy, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. I think this kind of goes off what you were just speaking about. But in school, we're taught about the efficient market theory. Um, but then we see kind of these 100 plus bit movements by the market caused by a Fed announcement, some kind of macroeconomic data coming out. Um, and it kind of seems like the market is almost pricing stuff in, you know, on its toes or reacting more than pricing a lot of stuff in. Um, so I was just kind of curious, do you think that, you know, this current generation of investors, those who started managing money in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, have been kind of blindsided by a prolonged period of free money and low rates um, and is not properly under and is underestimating kind of what lies ahead, you know, maybe a period of prolonged inflation or whatnot. Yeah, I, I think the way I look at it is that I don't particularly care about the market and what's going on at a index or market level. And I think most investors are better off if they focus in a lot more on individual businesses and what's going on with the individual businesses. And that's where you can find some inefficiency. So for example, if you picked any random stock on the New York Stock Exchange, just threw a dart at all the stocks in the New York Stock Exchange, and you just look at the 52-week range on any random stock, it'll be a pretty wide range. It might be like 50 to 100. And this will be like 50 to 100 in a benign environment with nothing going on. You know, the index has moved 2% in a year or something. It'll still be, it'll, you'll still see a range which is very wide. And if you see another stock, it'll be like 60 to 130 or that sort of thing. When you compare that to, let's say, for example, the price of a home across the street. And if you had a realtor friend who gave you a quote on that home every day, and you ask them, hey, what's this home worth today? And then what's it worth tomorrow? Change in a year would be maybe 5 10% max. It might be less than 5% in most years. But if that home were listed on some equity exchange, we would see much wider price ranges on that over the year. It would behave like the NYSE stocks behave. Because of this larger degree of fluctuation, that's the reason people like me can make a living is the market is undershooting or overshooting all the time. And uh, the fact that we have such wide ranges, it's really in the nature of auction-driven markets to serve off us this wider range of prices on assets that shouldn't really move that much in a year. Google is a certain kind of business, and six months ago, it was a certain kind of business, and six months from now, it's a certain kind of business. And why should the value be 50 60% off in those short periods, especially when you're looking at long-term discounting back cash flows over the long horizon to get the value of that business. It just doesn't make much sense. So to the extent that the market misprices by underpricing a business significantly, we can benefit from that by buying it and take it from there. Auction-driven markets can serve up really, really incredible valuation from time to time. I had mentioned Turkey and I mentioned that warehouse operator. When we invested in 2019, the market cap of that company was $20 million. And you could have very quickly liquidated the entire portfolio for 800 million or more and paid off the 200 million of debt and you would end up with at least 600 million. So we were looking at something that was priced at less than 4% of liquidation value in a negotiated transaction. I'm never going to be able to pick up a piece of real estate at even in some of the most yeah. distressed uh, situations. I'm never going to be able to pick up a piece of real estate at 4%. And what the market priced three and a half years ago at 20 million it prices today at $270 million in dollars. So for whatever reason, the market decided it's worth 
13, 14 times that now. It's the same here, warehouses. and but still undervalued. And in fact, what's happened is that because of all these Russians and Ukrainians that have come in, I think that if they were to sell their footprint today, my guess is they would get, and they've paid off most of the debt, they would probably get somewhere north of a billion, maybe a billion and a half, somewhere in that range, uh, one to 1.5 billion. So we are at 270 20. million. We're not at 3% anymore. Which are 25%. Uh, yeah, we are 25%. So a lot more efficient. Sure, but there's still there's still some skin in the game there. And yeah, so that's particularly particularly is a is a fun example for me because I think that the people who run that business are really good capital allocators. And I think they've done a bunch of smart things the last three and a half years. And I think they'll keep doing smart things. So I think if I fast forward 10 or 20 years, I think that business is probably in 2040, it would not surprise me if it's got a market cap of 10 billion. That would not surprise me at all. And focus I have is to spend all my time speaking to the UNC Flagler students and not touch the stock. Yeah. Awesome. That's a, just that's twiddle, a great... Just twiddle my thumbs yeah. for the next 18 <laughs> years. Like Rip Van Winkle, I think I just need to go to sleep. Put your feet up on the desk. As, yeah, as exactly. They say. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's an interesting point about how the market is pricing securities uh, very often, um, but that's not a true reflection of value. Um, how often do you look at your PL and how long, how often should managers on average look at their PL and you know, does it cause bad behavior when they look at it on a daily basis? I think so one of my one of my principles is that when you find yourself at the bottom of a deep well, you need to have a rope to get out. What I mean by that is that, so if I go back to 2008 and 09, so at that time, I think it was down like 65, 67% from the peak, from the peak in 2007 to the bottom in March, 2009, we were probably down two thirds. And I used to be managing like 600 million in 2007, and I was managing less than 200 million in 2009. And everything looked beat up, right? And so what I did, I think the rope I used at that time was I just created a spreadsheet which showed me what these businesses were worth and what the portfolio was worth. And the portfolio was actually worth more than 600 million. And uh, so I didn't fixate on, oh, you know, the market value is so much and this and that, because again, we're not looking for the market to instruct us. We, right. we, we have other places to get instructed. To and serve then I think, you, as you said. And I think from March, 2009 to December, 2009, the funds were up like 135%. And they kept going after that because we could just see, we could see the businesses and we could see what it's worth. Even when we looked at this business in Turkey, Resas, at 20 million, I did all the due diligence. I couldn't come up with a valid reason. I asked myself whether the guys were crooks, whether the everything was fraudulent, whether those places actually existed. I went and visited all the warehouses and I met the management and they looked like perfectly honest people to me. And uh, so I couldn't find anything wrong with it. And so we're not going to use the stock price to instruct us. We're going to use fundamentals to instruct us. So how often do you look at your p and uh, Yeah, I don't fixate on stock prices. I think that if I'm not traveling or something, I'll probably look at stuff once a day or a couple of times a day. But sometimes I may not get to looking at valuations or whatever, or even stock prices for one or more days at a time. I usually try to at least take a peak once a day. We don't have too many positions. Most of our funds have only eight or nine stocks. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to tell what's going on. Gotcha. You are a uh, philanthropist. And I would say that one of the more valuable things that you have beyond your net worth is your checklist, which you are protective of. So when does that go into uh, the public domain is the thing that you're giving away to society? Yeah, we may publish it at some point, but I think the, the I've actually talked a fair bit about 
there's really no special secret sauce to my checklist. I think if you saw it, you might be a little bit disappointed. Oh, it's so simple. But basically the way the checklist was created was I looked at investments that did not work out for great investors. So this is a relatively easy exercise to do because we have in the US, we have 13 F filings. So we can tell when somebody buys something. We can also tell when they sell something and we can come up with some average buy price and average sell price because it's happened during the quarter. So you can come up with approximately what somebody may have made or lost when they sold an investment. So if I have someone like Warren Buffett, for example, it's relatively easy to come up with a list which says, okay, look, these are all the businesses that Buffett invested in that were actually a real life loss in the end. For example, and the question I asked myself is that, let's say US Air was a company that Buffett bought long many years ago. And it, uh, US Air actually in the end did work out because they had a preferred and such. But let's say they, they lost money on US Air. So the question I would ask, or IBM might be a better example, right? So IBM was an example of what Buffett bought and actually he had a realized loss on that. The question I would ask myself is, okay, when he made the investment in IBM, what was the thesis and what was visible or easily visible at that time that was somehow missed by this great investor. And, and so actually, when you start looking at these companies and asking these questions, it becomes really obvious. And so if I just stay on IBM for a second, what IBM had done at the time Warren bought the stock was that they had published five-year advance guidance, clearly stating what their cash flows and revenues and type uh, amount of buybacks were likely to be over the next five years. And I think the mistake Warren made was he relied very heavily on the document. And he had no reason not to rely on that document because the people who put that document up were very high quality people. They believed the document. They weren't trying to snow investors or something. But if one paid more attention to what was going on with the business, there were some trademarks there that one could look at. And, and one would have seen that there were some issues there, which later became a lot more significant as they went along. So in that case, for example, there was a very strong, I would say, probability put on the guidance given and not as strong a perspective on some of these other things that were relevant to the company and so on. And when I did the checklist, for the most part, we could tell relatively easily what was the factor or factors that a great mind had missed. And then we just, the factor that got missed, we just added that to the checklist. Yeah. Okay. And once I had all these different factors from all these different investments by great investors, I resorted them by category because they fell into a few different categories. And the single largest reason for investment not working out when we looked at all the different failures was leverage. So they were, they probably, we have probably about 30 questions related yeah. to leverage in the yeah. checklist. The second reason why the investment didn't work out was some type of a error or misunderstanding on the moat or competitive advantage of the business. So that was another big category, another probably 20, 30 questions. And the third was something related to the management of ownership, you know, some nuance on that front. And then you get to unions and environment and other things which are more lower down. But basically, the two or three things that really stood out was, which was the biggest issue. The capitalism is creative destruction. And all businesses are under assault all the time. And so the ability of a business to withstand those constant attacks for a long period of time is more the exception than the rule. And so people tend to misunderstand or misjudge. If we, if we look at a business like Apple, for example, it looks bulletproof, right? It's such a strong franchise and such a strong following. and They could raise prices significantly and people aren't going to switch to Android or anything. You know, it's, it, there's a very strong loyalty there. When I look into the future, I don't see anything 
affecting their competitive advantage for 10 years. I think I can make a fairly strong case that it's unlikely Apple goes into decline by 2032 and such. I think it might be cranking till then. But I can't make that statement about 2042. So what looks stable for five or 10 years, I have no idea what happens in 15 or 20 years. Yeah. And the thing is, if, if Apple has a real problem by 2037, where it's already gone into significant decline, that's an issue for people investing today. That's a real issue. And, and these are difficult questions to answer. And, and that's why I think assessing the durability of a moat is a tough question. Uh, Manish, that was a fantastic answer. Oh, thank you. So now you have the whole checklist. You all see. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I wasn't taking notes. Yeah. A question from Jared. Yeah. So thanks, Cameron. And uh, definitely appreciate you taking the time, Monish. I think a question that I have um, when we think about investment management and in particular alternative investments, you know, I'd love to get your view on what is what is an alternative investment as a, it's a pretty broad definition. And then, you know, I think in terms of understanding where uh, companies that are, you know, alternative asset managers currently are really concentrated on growing that asset base through retail distribution channels. And we'd love to kind of get your viewpoint on, is that a positive, is that a negative? Um, and ultimately, if, if you're a retail investor, how should you be thinking about where you're putting your money from an asset management perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. I People lose me when they say alternative investment because I think that's a really big tent. It doesn't really say much. But I would say that some of these efforts to move some of these investments into the hands of retail investors uh, may be good. If the manager is good and the, the quality of the assets and such are good. If a retail investor historically did not have access to, let's say, infrastructure investments or class A office buildings and different things like that, where it was much more limited. I don't think it's so much whether these, whether it's right or wrong to direct these at retail. I don't think that's so much the issue. I think the bigger issue I have is, is the manager good? Are the assets good? And are the returns likely to be good? And if those factors are met, then if they are directed, I think in our regulatory frameworks, there are a lot of checks and balances to protect the individual retail investor. There's a lot of pieces in place there. And, uh, and so I think that the more important thing is how does the manager think and how is he likely to do? And is the risk muted? And if those are in place, then it's perfectly fine. I don't see much of an issue. I think even when retail investors invest in mutual funds, which are holding a hundred stocks, how much do they understand about those holdings? I think the difficult, the difficulty is not in the disclosures. I think the difficulty is that people don't do the work. So it's not so much an issue on the investment manager side. I think that there's more education needed for the retail investor that if you're going to step away from passive and such, then you really need to roll up your sleeves and do the work. And most retail investors aren't willing to do that. And so they end up in places where they shouldn't be. That makes sense. Thanks for that question, Jared. Arvind, I see you have your hand raised. Hi, hi, Monish. Uh, really great uh, uh, to meet you. Uh, I'm also a Clemson alumni, so go Tigers. Um, my question to you is: is going back to the uh, you you were you were talking about the that Turkish uh, bottle uh, manufacturer. I'm just curious. You know, when you're looking at firms, uh, you know, when you're looking for some of these like hidden gems in like emerging markets, is there a specific strategy that maybe you use personally to tr try to uncover some of these, um, you know, companies that are good to invest in the long term? What I did in Turkey was that I have a good friend who's a investment manager in Turkey, and he's he's overdosed on Graham, and I'm trying to get him to overdose more on Munger. But he comes to Omaha and he's from our side of the tent, if you will. I understand how he thinks because he's following those similar frameworks. So I basically just said to him in 2018 that, hey, would you mind if we just visited companies that are in your portfolio? So I 
wasn't interested in visiting any company in Turkey that he didn't actually have an investment in because I wanted to look at businesses that had already gone through one filter that he'd actually put dollars against it, not some business that he thought might be good or he was researching or something. And I found that exercise very useful because he was very knowledgeable about the businesses and I could look at the businesses and draw my own assessments about them. And I continued that in 2019. We again went and visited more businesses in his portfolio. And that's when we met the warehouse operator and other businesses like that. So yeah, I think that I'm looking, I think that when I step out of the U.S., when I go outside the U.S. shores, governance becomes really important. Integrity becomes really important. A bunch of things that I take for granted in the U.S. just don't apply. So the odds that I would lose money in the United States, public markets from outright fraud are minuscule. It's happened in the past, but it's never happened to me. And it's unlikely to happen to me. The odds I would lose money in the U.S. because I'm stupid is very high. So we just, I think here in the U.S., we need to protect against stupidity. We don't need to protect so much against fraud. I think when we go into places like Turkey, we have to first make sure that we have eliminated fraud risk and governance risk, and then we can go into the business and such. How hard is that to do diligence? Like I said, that's why I took the stance of going in and looking at businesses that my friend already owned, because I knew that because when I talked to him about different management teams, he's got 20 years history on the person because mm. it's known in the community and different things that I would never uncover no matter how much I worked at it. And it made it relatively easy because I could get a lot of data on these businesses. I would not have the wherewithal to go into a place like Turkey and just start running screens. That just is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Uh, so if anybody has another question, please raise your hand. Uh, I will ask one while we wait. Uh, you know, Buffett has chosen to compound his capital and then give it back at some point. You've chosen to uh, start your philanthropy, philanthropic endeavors while you're still alive. Why the difference? Yeah, and I think the, the issue is that I thought that giving money away is a lot more difficult than making it. This was a notion I had about 16 years ago when I started. And I think that's it's proven out. I agree with that statement even more now than I did earlier. And I didn't want to get to being 80 years old and then having to figure out what to do. The only thing I could do at that point was write checks. If my brain was still functioning, that's all I could do is just write checks. Yeah. And, uh, and probably those checks might not go to the right places because I hadn't spent enough time looking at things. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to start early not with very large amounts. So I committed when I was like 42 or something to give away 2% of my net worth every year. And 2% is not going to put me in the poor house. And hopefully we're compounding at more than 2%. So the net worth is actually going up every year. And, and I expected probably because I was doing so much work in India that I'd probably get my head handed to, to me for the first 10 years. And that would be fine. That'd be the tuition bill to play. And then in the 11th year onwards, I'd actually be able to make a difference. And what actually ended up happening is we got traction in the first few weeks and we hardly got our head handed to us. It was really fast. And the RO, ROI, the social return on invested capital that Dakshana gets in India is off the charts. It's just yeah. actually worked out 10X better than I ever thought possible. And uh, so basically that, 15, 16 years has given me a lot of experience and knowledge. And now we've been looking at scaling it, scaling it up, but I still won't, I still am not looking at scaling it where a quarter of my net worth is going into the charity yeah. next, next year or something. We still keep ramping it up, but I'll keep increasing the amounts as my expiry date <laughs> approaches. So I used to think that I was going to leave planet Earth on June 11th, 2044. And recently I found out that I'm actually leaving on June 11th, 2054. So I suddenly got 10 more years. And, and I got, if it's 
2054, I got like 32, 31, 32 years left, 31 and a half years left. And so the good news with knowing when you're going to exit planet Earth is then you can plan backwards. And so now I, now that I know my expiration date, I know what I got to do in the next 10 years and the next 20 years. And then by the time I'm getting close to six, seven years left, it needs to be on the Chuck Freeney plan. If you guys have heard of Chuck Freeney, no. where the idea is that one day before departure, if I do this right, yeah. June 10th, 2054, 2054. there should be a hundred dollars left. <laughs> That's okay. the plan. So I, know, I know Billy has a question, but I can't not ask, how did you come up with June 11th, 2054? Well, you know, anytime you want to know an answer to any question like that, you just go to God Google. And if you go to God Google and say, hey, God Google, can you tell me when I'm going to, God Google will tell you when you're going to die. And if God Google doesn't tell you a good answer, then go to the MetLife website and they'll tell you. And, and so my birthday is June 12th. I think it should be poetic, just it's exactly one day before the birthday. Yeah. So you can add that you can add the exact day, but the year they'll give you the year. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, Billy, uh, last question is yours. Uh, thank you, Manisha. I think it's a wonderful uh, conversation. You know, and uh, you even have my experience and age learned quite a bit. But my question really focuses on defining value investing versus growth investing. You know, with a lot of students here, you hear that phrase. Um, the cu couple of Carl I was at is, does it matter whether it's growth or value? Considering Bill Miller, one of the great value investors, was one of the early investors in AOL, which was questionable as of whether it's a growth stock, which it, you know, you know to, uh, identified as. So does that matter to you when you break down that? Or is it more of what your, as you call your valuation and your long-term um, prognosis for a company is? Well, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. So I think the ideal investment is one that has a long growth runway. And even if you were to pay an expensive looking price, if you are right on the runway and the growth rate and the, the length of time that this business can grow and compound, Walmart would have been a great investment at 50 times earnings in the 70s even a hundred times earnings in the 70s because just the runway was so long and you would have still had double digit returns paying a very high multiple for a business like Walmart when it was really growing a lot. Of course, the difficulty is that it's very hard to look deep into the future. Like we saw with the Apple example, how can we know in 1975 what Walmart looks like in 2000, for example? Those are really tough questions. So the way we kind of hack that is we demand a large margin of safety. So we say, okay, yeah, we know that this thing could go on for a long time, but if it only goes on for 10 years, I still don't lose money. And uh, so that's how you kind of hack around it. But the number one thing to look for is great growing businesses. That's really the holy grail. Even the business I invested in Turkey, the warehouse operator at less than 4% of liquidation value, what I'm most excited about that business is that when they reinvest capital in dollars or euros, they are not willing to do it at below a 25 to 35% return. Wow. So their reinvestment, and I've seen it from the beginning. I looked at all the things they do. These guys don't do dumb things. If they can't get their money back and the father, son that run it, the father never went to college. He just says, if I can't get my money back in three years, I'm not interested. I prefer getting it back in one year and maybe two years, but Three years is the outer limit. And uh, they made an investment. They put solar panels on all their rooftops. And it was 50 million of investment with 10 million a year coming back as what they were getting back in terms of the energy produced. So I questioned them. I said, you know, yeah, it's five years. <laughs> I said, you disappoint me. What, could, what went on here? They said, we really struggled with this. But they said, we knew it was five years, but we also know that those rates are going up quite a bit because Turkey has no energy source. They import everything. Mm -hmm. So they said this was on the edge and it really kind of hemmed and hawed. We hemmed and hawed about it, but we finally went for it. Actually, it's a great thing because that business that they spent 50 million on, they could sell it for 200 million today because it's the solar panels that were deployed 35, 40 years ago are still producing power. The ones that are being deployed today, which are much more advanced than the ones... 
35 years ago, they may be around 60 or 70 years from now. So that, that runway is incredible. And so I told them, I'm glad you lowered your bar a little bit and got that done because that was a good deal. Yeah. And they said it was just right on the edge, but we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Manish, you have been gracious with your time. Uh, we appreciate you spending the time with us today, uh, giving us really great, uh, insightful answers. Appreciate that. I appreciate what you've done with Dakshana. Uh, and um, anytime you want to practice the Feynman method on us, where you have to teach people to make yourself better, we're here. All right. No, it was a lot of fun to speak to all of you. I spent three wonderful years in the Carolinas. Yeah. And it's probably an amazing part of the country. I think I never realized how awesome it was till I left the Carolinas. <laughs> and so you're in a very nice place and it's in a great part of the world. And I think UNC is just a great school. So it's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monish. It was great to have you here, Cam. Thank you for moderating a really engaging discussion. And to the audience, thank you all for being here. Hopefully, you know, we'll have many more events like this. And if you want to stay connected with us, I just dropped in a few things in the chat. Um, but please, you know, stay connected. And again, Monish and Cam, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today.